Hello, I'm Josephine Burton and welcome back to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. Built as a Huguenot church uh, in the 18th century. And from the beginning it was a Huguenot church. was born as a Huguenot church. It was originally erected to be used by French And then Huguenot. became a proselytising church as well to the incoming Jewish refugees. It was also briefly used in 1809 as a mission for converting Jews to Christianity. It became a Methodist church. Or becoming a Methodist chapel in 1890. The beginning of 19th century. It became a synagogue. It became a synagogue. And then became a, a synagogue for not quite a hundred years. Then sold to the Misiki Hadass Society, but its English name was the Spitalfields Great Synagogue. And then in 1976, it became a mosque. And from 1976, it has been used for the Muslims as a mosque. And now the main Bangladeshi mosque on Brick Lane. The building at 59 Brit Lane in the heart of London's East End has been a spiritual and communal home for so many people over the years. I've walked past it many times, particularly hopping between Dash Arts' space at Toynbee Studios and our partner Rich Mix at the top of Brit Lane, where in pre-Covid times, Dash Arts has put on hundreds of live gigs, productions and events. In this podcast, I'm going to find a little more out about the stories, the people and why 59 Brit Lane has been so continuously used and adapted. I speak to architects and artists, academics and some of the people who currently congregate at the Brit Lane Mosque. Here's writer Rachel Lichtenstein, who researched the building as part of her book on Brit Lane. I mean, the building is really an iconic part of British Jewish history. One of the first synagogues in the country for the ultra-Orthodox and a major seat of Jewish learning as well, because it had a very big Talmud Torah school next door. There are lots and lots of memories of uh, young Jewish boys going there to uh, to learn. There's a description here um, by George Sims, written in 1911. The synagogue is only dimly lighted. Here and there, a few worshippers are sitting in the pews, repeating their prayers or reading a tattered volume. In one pew sits an old man writing by the aid of a tallow candle which he has stuck on the little shelf in front of him. He is writing out one of the tiny scrolls, which encased in the capsule of tin or glass, forms the mezuzah, the amulet, which every Orthodox Jew places on his doors. Or perhaps the miniature manuscript is intended to be placed inside the tefillin, which are bound round the head and the left arm for the morning prayers. We look at the old man writing by the gleam of the candle in the gloomy synagogue with feelings of awe and reverence. And I think that's, it's a very romantic description, you know, written by a non-Jew wandering around. So, you know, it it was the key central, the biggest synagogue at the time uh, in the East End. It was the heart of the ultra-Orthodox community. So it was seen as the kind of seat of learning and a a lot of the smaller synagogues kind of amalgamated into uh, that one. Rachel told me about Rabbi Werner, the rabbi of the Marsike Hadass synagogue, who died in 1912. When he died, this this orthodox rabbi, there were literally, it was like one of those scenes in Israel, you know, when a great rabbi dies, there were tens of thousands of people lined the streets in Brick Lane. It was a huge, huge, the biggest funeral of the time. He was carried out of the synagogue. This is from the Manchester Guardian. 23rd of December, 1912. Early in the morning, the coffin was removed from his house to the Spitalfields Great Synagogue, which is the other name it was known by. Great crowds assembled around the building, which was guarded by a strong force of police. At one o'clock, the coffin, which was covered with a plain cloth, was carried out of the synagogue, where a crowd estimated to be between 20 to 30,000 people waited. As a mark of honour, the coffin was to be borne a considerable distance, followed by pupils of the Brick Lane Talmud Torah. The procession and over 220 carriages waited along the Whitechapel Road and the coffin was carried through Brick Lane. 
the police who numbered over 100 had great difficulty in restraining the people who in their anxiety to touch the coffin pushed and jostled each other to such an extent the bearers could merely make any progress. It's just an extraordinary scene to imagine that happening outside that building. I recently launched a project which is a memory map of the Jewish East Stand. The memory map of the Jewish East Stand is based on a survey of London digital mapping of Whitechapel. And we developed this other project out of which is a different layer of memory literally mapped over the Jewish East Stand. And most of the audio recordings are snippets of the oral history interviews that I have gathered over the last 30 years working in the area. And there's some lovely um, interviews there, some memories by people who are no longer with us talking about the Masiki Hadass synagogue. And one of them is um, from Maya Bogdansky, who was a Polish Jewish tailor, um, a, a great Yiddish fist and singer who took over the Friends of Yiddish Literary Society after the poet Avram Stenzel died. But um, Maya talked about post-war, how there'd be, always be somebody outside on a Saturday morning trying to look for a minion because after having it being you know, the biggest synagogue that could hold a couple of thousand people, that the community was starting to leave. Yeah, to most of the synagogues, which were mostly the converted rooms, that was quite a big purpose build. It wasn't a purpose build, it was originally a Yukon chapel. It was never even all that popular because the Jews, the, most of the people came here like their little, what they call steeples. They could speak Yiddish, they could meet their friends. It was, uh, it was only like was the gentry that had them there because it was probably more expensive. There were steps you went up to get to the door. I can't see the steps. They may have been there. Yeah. And I remember the first time I must have been about six. Or... Was it with my brother? He must have been about four. Anyway, we're waiting for Mazika Dust to open. And children come past and they throw things at us and call us dirty Jews. I went home to my mother and I asked her if I, if I was dirty, do I need to wash? I didn't understand. I was quite often approached by the shamash outside. But boy, you, you haven't done many. <laughs> you haven't come in. He needed, he needed a tent for a cottage here. So, so he stood outside. Whenever he, see, he saw somebody Jewish or thought he was Jewish, I loved hearing those clips from Rachel's memory map, particularly Maya Bogdansky's voice. By coincidence, a band I used to sing in 20 years ago made a track which sampled an interview with the late Maya. We'll play a little bit from the track Pagamenska by Oi Vavoy at the end of the podcast. As Rachel explained, the Jewish community in London's East End started to move away in the 50s and 60s. The Mazik de Hadash congregation moved to Golders Green in northwest London. Rachel recalled historian David Jacobs telling the story of how he'd gone into the building sometime after their departure. So David Jacobs told me that when he walked into that building for the first time, you know, all the ritual objects had been removed. It was in a very poor condition. The windows were broken and leaves and debris covered the floor. Um, But there were various papers left and a clock face with Hebrew numbers on it. It was dark and dusty and quite spooky. Brick Lane and Spitalfields increasingly became a focal gathering point for the Bangladeshi community in London. I tracked down Ansar Ahmed Ullak at the Swadhinta Trust, a charity which promotes Bengali history and culture in the UK, to give us some more context. The first first large-scale uh, migration policy took place during the 50s and 60s, similar to other South Asians who came from India and Pakistan and uh, Afro-Caribbean who came from the West Indies. Um, they, they were mainly economic migrants who uh, came here looking for a better life um, and they came here to, to work in the health sector, in the transport system, and in the factories up in the north. The building, uh, as you probably know, was built um, in 1743, 
but the the um, the building was acquired by the local Bengali Muslim community in the 70s. I think in terms of specific date, it was it was in 1976 that they they acquired the building, and and converted to the uh, to the to the Brick Lane Mosque, what we we see today. It was a synagogue at the time when they they acquired the building. So in order for it to become a mosque, they had to um, create a, a, a larger space on the ground floor. Um, because for Muslims, they, they need to stand in row behind the Imam facing the Makkah to, to pray five times a day. So they, they clear, basically they, they cleared out all the pews and the, um, I guess, non-permanent structures like fittings uh, and stuff. And, and and create a much larger space on the on the ground floor for people to you know come together five times a day and, and pray um so since 1976 you know it is the the brick lane mosque that we know of it today and i would say it's probably um the kind of central mosque of bengali muslims is the is the main is is considered to be the main mosque for the local bengali muslim population do you know anything about the kind of the, the, the how it how it happened? Like, you know, was this, the synagogue was it empty? Would you know anything about the conversations that happened that made it possible for the for the mosque to emerge? By by the mid seventies, the Jewish population decreased, and the um, the numbers that were attending the synagogue had had also dropped. And at some point, I guess the the Jewish leadership felt that it wasn't really viable of keeping a, a running synagogue and we're thinking of selling it and that's when the Bengali community approached the Jewish leadership. I think the, the Jewish leadership was um, pleased in a way because they felt that it was still going to be used as a place of worship and as a result they were very forthcoming and from what I'm told that they, they sold the building to the Muslim community uh, at a much uh, lower rate than market value of the time because of the fact that it was going to be used as a place of worship. Ansa introduced me to Hamouz Ali, who's the vice chair of the Brick Lane Mosque, to give a little more detail. During the 70s, decades when it started, uh, say, 71, when Bangladesh uh, was created back home, uh, during that time, the Bengali community uh, felt that they need a place to, um, I mean, congregate, uh, to do their prayers, as well as uh, as a community to meet, you see. And this is yeah. how, is, uh, I mean, it came about um, as a mosque. So uh, from then on, uh, this building is used, obviously, uh, mainly for the mosque, but this is also the center uh, where Bengali people uh, got together in various crises. Uh, so, for example, if they are uh, attacked even uh, for, I mean, when I say attack, I mean uh, the racial attack and all those stuff. Uh, so uh, so uh, mainly that building uh, was the uh, focus point for the Bengali community for their uh, um, communal community purposes. Mm. But you have a school for after school, don't you, for the young people attached to the for in the, in the for the community? Uh, later on, uh, we have started. Well, uh, when it started, I was one of them as well. Uh, we started uh, uh, the class for the young ones, the Islamic class, uh, and for the young ones, and also uh, for the adult one as well. In the evening, we. Uh, we try to educate the adults who didn't have the chance to um, got uh, educated in their religious uh, side of it. Uh, and now we are running a madrasa, which is a full pleasant madrasa. A madrasa is another word for a religious school, you see. I remember walking around the streets with Bill Fishman decades ago and you know, watching Muslim men coming out of the mosque dressed in white for Ramadan and him saying, I remember, Bill Fishman remembers seeing an almost identical scene with 
bearded Orthodox Jewish men uh, pouring out into the streets um, for Yom Kippur when he was a child. So there's just been that kind of continuous story happening in that building. It's had this kind of continuous um, use. Clearly the reverence that the, com- the Bengali community tr- uh, treat the building with is, is very, very special. It certainly is. And it's kind of, you know, it's remained at the heart of the community. Why, why do you think it has? Why do you think it has? Is it just luck or is there something else about that building or its location that's enabled that to happen? I think it's partly due to the size of it. I don't know. I mean, it's also, I think it's grey two listed, so it might be that it cannot um, change, but it suited its purpose. I mean, the thing that's very interesting about that building, and this is why I'm intrigued by you refer to it as 59 Brick Lane, because it makes it sound like a domestic building, and it really isn't. You know, it's a purpose-built chapel so it was originally built for these, you know, quite quite wealthy uh, a Huguenot community that were living in the area. And the size of the building um, and the fact that it's always managed to maintain its religious status reflects the size of those communities who were living in the area at the time. And that they managed to um, keep up the building and then transform it Uh, for different ritual uses for different cultural groups. I reached out to Rosalind Parker, an academic who's written on faith in the public space, to talk this through further. It's not just the sheer size of that building and the size of the main kind of sanctuary room, which is so flexible. But, you know, the fact that that building is on a crossroads, it's quite fascinating. It's really accessible to people at the heart of the community. And Brick Lane has always been a kind of a, a significant thoroughfare. So it's definitely located centrally in the community and whatever community was living there. And it's accessible on all sides. It's on a cro- you know, it's on, it's, it corners the building. So it's got different entrances that you can make. There are lots of reasons why it makes sense geographically for it to be useful. The interesting thing, I think, is that um, there are some great pictures that some, I think uh, someone was referring me to. Um, not only is the main sanctuary still the space of prayer, but there are phenomenal. I was watching this phenomenal video from the seventies of the the kind of um, the school that happened for the children of the Bangladeshi community, so they could learn that they could learn learn, learn um, the Quran, but also learn Bengali. You know, like it was happening upstairs in the cramped quarters. All these young, beautiful videos of these young people all learning together, and the rooms that they were using was where the sun, the Jewish Sunday school was. They were also upstairs at the top of the building, so that it's not. Not just the like the prayerful the prayer is happens in the same space but also the kind of building of community is functioning in the same way and there apparently there are these plaques on the on the walls that you know like are the dedication to the sunday school in the name of a patron um where from when it was a jewish the, the jewish sunday school it still is on the wall now apparently in the in the mosque so there's like this lovely there's there's, there's something that uh it's not just about whether this the spiritual axis element But there's something else about the community hub which has lived on as it's changed as the as the community as the focus of the community you know as the as the as the kind of the main religion has changed of the community so has the building uh hearing you talk is making me think the importance of as you say the area is such a thoroughfare but also the importance of the um the landmark and how important that is for a faith building so there is something of, and I think impressive is, is not, is a very cold word, but there's something about um, an anchoring about the, the building as it is, which means that it sort of gives permission for the thoroughfare within it as well. Because you do need those lovely sort of uh, currents of community. Community doesn't just gather in en masse once as a whole. It needs to be able to fluidly and more organically operate with all the different demands of a faith space. Celebration of thoroughfare, I think, is such a wonderful thing to be able to to embrace as part of a religious priority, to, to, to be able to coexist within what Brick Lane means to people who live in London. 
it's it's a, it's a real statement of religious resilience to live in that postcode. Rosalind's reference to the landmark is quite fascinating. 59 Brit Lane is an impressive Georgian building, but its architecture doesn't necessarily shout out that it's a religious site. In fact, it was only in 2009 that the building gained a minaret. The architect, Shahid Salim, is curating the UK Architectural Pavilion in the Venice Biennale this year. The UK's pavilion focuses on the history of the British mosque and includes the Brick Lane Mosque itself. We chatted about the building. I was thinking a little bit about what is fascinating about the building is that it isn't the Hawksmoor Cathedral, it's fairly innocuous. It's it's on the corner of a you know, of a busy junction. Um and, and in some ways it's a great place for a minority community that's feeling a little bit threatened in its in its in in this majority culture, whether it's the Huguenots, whether it's the Jews or the Muslims, to, to, to sort of inhabit because it is it doesn't really stick out. The the minaret obviously was a bit controversial because the minaret has made is more of a statement, particularly the kind of the, its beauty and it's just unusual and it works beautifully, I think, in you know, in a very striking way. But it definitely is a sort of is a signifier in the ways that it, 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 as as being a religious building in a way that the others it hadn't been until that point. Did you did you think about that? Obviously, you must think a lot about the symbolism of, of the minaret. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the minaret is interesting on on the Brick Lane Mosque because um, it's it's a visual symbol of uh, Islamic architecture that that has taken a long time to for the for the mosque to achieve. Um, you know, they had tried to uh, adapt the building or, or embellish the building with. Um, sort of Islamic motifs and uh, architectural references um, over the years, but unsuccessfully because it's a listed building, um, it's very difficult to um, uh, adapt it, to alter it, uh, especially externally. So, you know, all of their attempts previously to add minarets to the building or to add any any sort of Islamic uh, styling to the building were not successful. So this minaret that's built now was part of a sort of um i think it was part of a wider uh, project of uh, of kind of street art and street works and street sculpture along brick lane so the minaret i think is very much part of a it's almost acts as a symbol for the local area as much as it is a minaret for the mosque so it's a kind of symbol of brick lane and the uh, sort of bangladeshi community that's there now here's hamad ali we wanted something something to give it the uh, mosque feeling, you know what I mean? Because uh, we can touch the building as it is, and we also uh, respect and honor the previous, uh, you know, the uh, charts and uh, the, uh, I mean, while it was uh, as a, what you call, synagogue. So uh, we don't want to uh, sort of uh, uh, um, uh, how do I say it? Uh, not to harm one another beliefs or uh, uh, keeping keeping uh, keeping the history as it is, you know. But uh, at the same time, we wanted to give it a, a, a mosque look, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, uh, we've been trying to talk to the council. Uh, can you uh, can you build something on the side of it without uh, uh, harming the building or without uh, uh, damaging? the um, heritage on the uh, uh, and the political character of the building um, and and then they came out with an idea and this is how we uh, built the minaret and it was funded by the council and it's a it, it's a beautiful unusual structure yeah yeah it's beautiful it's a, uh, uh, somehow it goes with the building now doesn't it yeah it really does Ansa and I also discussed the minaret it's a real symbol of pride. I mean, in some ways, I think, uh, as a minority culture, that as for, for, for a minority community, that building has always sort of served as a sort of refuge, right? It served as a refuge for the Huguenots, for the Jewish communities, a place of com- kind of identity, proud internal identity, a place where you could be. And it was fairly innocuous for years. And I, and I wonder if in some ways that the, the symbolism of, of such a striking mosque being placed on the minaret, being placed on the outside of the building, is in some ways potentially a sign of the community becoming more confident and assertive about its identity in the UK. Am I drawing kind of mad conclusions, or would you say that 
that, they're, they're, that, they're, that the community does feel more comfortable now than it did perhaps in the 70s? Yes, like I said, uh, it's a very much a confident, established community now, very assertive of their existence. And of course, that they are proud of the mosque itself because the mosque is in the middle of the heartland of the Bengali community. Uh, you know, uh, Brick Lane and the, and the surrounding area is also known as Bangla Town. And the mosque is right in the middle of it. And the minaret is really a symbolic gesture. It's not really serving um, historical purpose of calling out for prayer. Uh, I mean, that's what the minaret is used for in the, in the olden days. This is more of a symbolic gesture that it's a, you know, a place of worship. It's, it, it's a mosque. And the, the, the Bengali community is proud of the fact that the mosque exists on Brick Lane itself because it's really... Um, deeply rooted into the community because the the mosque was set up by people from the community and even today the people who are running the mosque the people who sit on the management committee are from the local area and um, as i said you know there were the, some of them were the first settlers even today the people who sit on the management were um, activists of the anti-racist struggle of the 1970s and 80s. Some of them also had um, supported the Bangladesh independence movement in 1971. So it's very much intertwined with, with Bengali politics and its um, anti-racist struggle. So it's very much with the community and it, it kind of, I don't think it's seen as a separate to the community. It's part of the community. I remember taking around um, a, a very well-known saxophonist around the East End about 30 years ago, and we walked down Fournier Street, and I said, look up, and above, um, there's a sundial on the wall of that building, and it says the Latin words, umbra sumus, which translate to we are shadows. Um, and again, I think that's, and then he used it as the title for an album because it's so poetic and says so much about the layers of, uh, of history and different peoples that have lived in that area. The very well-known saxophonist that Rachel mentions is Jar Wobble. We've been playing excerpts from the title track of his album Umbra Summus throughout the podcast. And the quote itself comes from a poem by the Latin poet Horace. Its full reference is, We are but dust and shadow, and it inspired this podcast. The sundial and the quote were probably installed with the building in 1743, but it's as if the designer had this foresense of the local communities and the faiths that would rise and set within its walls. I spoke to Rosalind about the quote. And I think there is something... Wonderful about the imper you know, it references an impermanence, which is what is so natural, which is what's happened to the communities that have lived and used that building. If there is an element of impermanence, we are we are dust, we are all but dust and shadow. We will move on, it will become something else, and we will the world will refresh itself. And I love that as an expression. And I clearly, I don't think that wasn't the initial meaning behind the use of the quote. The quote was used by the community at the moment to, to signify our, the insignificance of our lives in the context of the divine, I imagine. And it's become something more important now, more relevant for the building. The fact that it is about the impermanence of, of human life, but also about religious coexistence, I think is rather wonderful. And it's a wonderful permission then that the architecture is giving itself to continued life beyond this. What Brick Lane gives us is this kind of really interesting time depth. So although they have altered the building and are now using it as a mosque. They are one in a sequence of people who have used that building for religious purposes, going back to 1743. Uh, and I think what that shows is that, or what we're saying with that, is that this process of, of firstly, the reuse of buildings to create religious space is not a new thing, but also the process of new communities, new religious communities, creating their religious spaces through the adaptation and uh, appropriation of existing buildings is also not a new thing. So what, what Muslim communities are doing in Britain now, or since the 1960s, let's say, 
uh, is something that many communities that came before them have also done. So Jewish populations that were here in the sort of you know early early twentieth and late nineteenth century, particularly in the East End, um, adapted existing buildings uh, to create to create synagogues and small places of worship. Um, Catholics did the same. You know, early Protestant communities did the same. So the idea is that kind of prayer can happen in any space. Actually, kind of re- religious worship can actually happen in any kind of space. The buildings are in in in, in many ways immaterial to the act of worship. Um, however, uh, you know what Brick Lane kind of shows us is so so you know the kind of the Umbra Simus quote. It, I think it touches on that sense of well immortality or well mortality, if you like. Sorry, so it touches on that sense of mortality um, that is shared across uh, sort of human experience, regardless of what particular faith people are uh, part of. And I think the Umbra Summers quote, it really kind of connects um, the story that we're telling with a kind of bigger story of humanity, I think, um, which is, you know, it's pretty amazing that we can make that connection on a side street in, in the East End, actually. So, you know, so I think that's why we really, really sort of like gives us that depth. You know, what's really lovely about what you've just said, um, Shahid, is that I, I, I always thought of the dust and shadow quote, you know, the, the we are nothing, we are but dust and shadow I always thought about in the, in the context of humankind, you know, that we are mortal, as you say, we will move on and something will replace us. But what you just said about the building being immaterial is just perfect because it also plays into that. It's not just, it's, we, we humans are, you know, nothing but dust and shadow, but that's all the buildings are too. And I hadn't, I hadn't got that in that moment until you just said that. And I was like, God, that's just beautiful that the building becomes part of the story. You know, that will move on as well that idea we are shadows and then they kind of disappear and another group is coming and you know if you just sit on brick lane today um well i don't know (laughs) about right now during lockdown but but pre-covid times if you can remember those there's always people coming and going and not just men praying there's lots of women going in and out there's all sorts of uh, different classes going on children you know it's it's a really lively vibrant alive part of that contemporary community and I'm sure it was exactly the same when it was the heart of the ultra-orthodox Jewish community in the East End. Shahid is also working with architects Matthew Lloyd and Dan Leon on a multi-faith project, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which will be both an interfaith community hub and a separate prayer space for the Abrahamic faiths throughout the weekend. It's a beautiful project, quite different to 59 Brit Lane, where the three faiths have overlapped through centuries. In their architectural vision, the faiths will overlap through a weekend. Dan Leon and I spoke about reusing faith buildings. The, the change of use of those buildings... I think we need to be more flexible about it. From what I understand, I don't think synagogues and mosques are actually uh, consecrated spaces. Churches are, but technically anywhere can become a mosque, anywhere can become a synagogue, you know, your, people's front rooms. And, 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 and in these days of um, this wonderful pandemic, these places are becoming, you know, people's front rooms and back gardens and tennis clubs are becoming synagogues and mosques and and whatever else. And so it's the flexibility of the use of space. um, I think we we do need to embrace on a practical level and on a uh, a, a, a social cohesion level as well. I, I can't see any downsides to it. Brit Lane Mosque and its history holds a fascination for so many people. Rebecca Kaufman, an American academic at New York University, has focused a lot of her research into architectural reuse on 59 Brit Lane. I tracked her down in Minnesota to help me understand why the building might have been so continuously used and reused. There's a practical, functional reason why the reuse of a building makes a lot of sense. This is a a building that's on the corner of a very busy thoroughfare that's really the heart of the community and it was the heart of the 
you know, it's been the heart of the immigrant community for the last 300 years, whether that's the Huguenot communities or the Jewish communities or the Muslim, the Bengali Muslim communities. That's having a having a place of worship that is that is large and um, available uh, and accessible makes a lot of sense. So there's mm -hmm. a sort of a, there's a sort of functional reuse that I understand. Mm -hmm. Um, there is there is a there's a potentially political reuse, which is about we are now the dominant religion in the area, and we claim this building to be ours, mm. um, which I think is not particularly confrontational in Brick Lane, mm. but potentially if you were to apply the same model to uh, Cordoba, <laughs> it has a different resonance. Um, uh, Jerusalem, even more so. Uh, but the, there's the other thing that I'm grappling with is: is there a spiritual element to it? Is there something the quintessentially kind of spiritual that remains in the bricks and mortar, which makes it attractive for reuse? Um, it's quite intangible. And uh, you know, when I asked the architect, Shahid, you know, he's like, "Well, I love the idea of it, but how do you quantify that? Like, you know, it's impossible <laughs> to, 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 you know, it's right. so it's, it's ephemeral. Maybe it's all, mm. but it's dust and shadow, as the building says on mm -hmm. the thing. But I wondered, have I have do you you think I've articulated that in it's very sort of in that three part way, or am I missing something? Let's see, political, communal. I, I agree with those three for sure. I'm thinking if there's others, you know, I do think maybe a factor of you know domination and migration is an interesting kind of counterpoint, you know, where you're thinking Cordova and you're thinking, yeah, this is a statement of triumphalism, versus here it's kind of a, a base of absence being filled, um, you know, because in Brick Lane, it's much more about why are people coming to the East End to start with, um, you know, and what happens before they get there, and then kind of an eventuality. And I think, you know, at 15 and Brick Lane, um, it starts with a different conversation of how something is responding to the dominant culture as opposed to the dominant culture in decline. Which I think is really interesting because this is a direct, you know, in fact, the dominant culture is now responding again where you have Huguenots building a chapel and then you have Hawksmoor building a church and you have this conversation going back and forth. And then the Huguenots, in fact, become, you know, very integrated in society. Then it becomes synagogue starting kind of humbly that then becomes integrated that then, you know, and you see these things happen through time. So I'm trying to think how to phrase that within the framework you presented where, you know, I'm thinking, yes, but maybe just a little differently. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the religious context you asked about a spiritual center or place. And I was, it's something I've been grappling with from my heritage perspective, because um, I was saying a lot of times, I think when we're trying to discuss how we see change over time in a building, we draw a lot of lines. I mean, literally, we're taught to draw lines and floor plans with color blocks of change over time. You know, this is the 18th century portion of the building. Here's the 19th century. You know, here's the change. And I was trying to conceptualize how we can discuss that differently. And especially in a religious space like 59 Brick Lane, um, I was using the idea of a center that doesn't change, you know, and is that the worship space? Is that the performative space? You know, you could, is that the sacred center? Um, and instead the change kind of expanding out from that point. And so what is it about the gravitational pull of that center? You know, is that metaphysical? Is that sociopolitical? You know, that could be a lot of things. Um, but maybe just in conceptualizing it that way, instead of layers built up over time, um, it helps us kind of reframe the conversation of how that use or that intangible aspect is actually the draw, as opposed to the bricks and mortar themselves. The argument I tried to make in writing about that building was to say, we say that heritage recognition is for things that are exceptional. You know, that's the point, and that's kind of the language that's used as we're saying there are lots of buildings People like vernacular architecture, but really the things we list are the things that are exceptional. And that's usually based on an original framework, right? So the reason 59 Brick Lane is listed is because it's a Huguenot chapel. And yes, other things happened over time, but it's really about Huguenot chapel. And you can see, um, especially in archival documentation, how that gets contested in planning. And I don't know how much you looked into the history of the minaret, but there were several attempts to have a minaret before that minaret was um, erected. And it started as early as the 1980s. And so the community there felt 
clearly that that was an important aspect of the building to really mark that they they were the ones meeting there now um, and that it was their space and that it was their community. And it was rejected on the stance of heritage both times when they had previously applied because it didn't fit the Huguenot context of what is perceived as Spitalfields heritage, um, you know, that kind of 18th century exterior. And so in following that minaret, basically the argument I tried to make was to say, we say we want to recognize exceptional things when they happen, and this building is exceptional. Like these transmutations of use is what makes this building exceptional. And so when somebody builds something exceptional as part of that process, why aren't we recognizing that as significant too? Um, and I think the minaret is really the pinnacle of that argument of going, you have this phenomenal thing that everyone acknowledges is beautiful, iconic, you know, um, architecturally significant, design specific, um, but it's not allowed to be considered part of the building's heritage. Why? I loved Rebecca's argument that 59 Brit Lane is exceptional because of the accumulation of its history, of the interplay of dust and shadow and its current living community. It made me wonder what the building's future holds. Who will the next inhabitants of the building be? In that whole area uh, the, that people are moving Further east, actually, I think a lot of people from from Whitechapel and Spitalfields are moving moving further east into into Redbridge and um, Newham. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean it's interesting because you know the East End has been has historically always been this place where you have waves of migration and and why should this one be any different in a way? I mean I I sort of calculated yeah. according to the numbers of, according to the time periods that each group was in the in that building. So each each denomination was in that building for about eighty years. So I sort of calculated that about 2050 would be the time for, according to that, I think around 2050 will be the time for the next use of that building to, to, to come about. Um, so let's see. Are you seeing yet evidence of the Bengali communities moving on from Bangladesh? Do you think that, that we might see in the next 40 years some change, you know, 30 years of changing in the community and what might the building become? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's true. Some people are moving out of of uh, Tower Hamlets. I think perhaps third, fourth generation who are doing well are moving towards east, Newham, Gansill, Redbridge, even further east. And I guess, you know, if you're looking a house with a garden, parking space, if you're looking for um, decent schools, you'd want to move out. So um, I think gradually people are moving out. But I think in terms of Bengali population, it hasn't really dropped. In fact, it has increased. According to 2011 census, there are now 80,000 Bengalis living in Tower Hamlets. And in Spitalfields, we are majority. I think we are at 70% of the population. But yes, who knows? You know, with time, this population may drop, as it's happened previously with the Jewish, uh, with the French Huguenot. They have all moved out. I really have no idea what would happen to the mosque. <laughs> one one can only guess, I guess. I mean, we've seen with, with churches that has been converted into apartment blocks or, you know, other places of worship or even restaurants. Or, But I, I think um, the, the Bengali population will be here for a while because economically the population, the local population are still, you know, aren't doing that well. Um, the un unemployment rate is high. And in fact, I think probably 90%, if not at least 80% of the accommodation is council flats and they're owned by local people. Uh, so they're not going anywhere. And all the, all the housing estates uh, east of Brick Lane, it's all council uh, dwellings. So I think, uh, you know, we're here to stay for long. <laughs> well, I'm, I, that was a beautiful answer. Thank you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not rushing you. I, I'm not rushing the community out of the building. But I, but I hope when it does move on, if it moves on, that in some ways the building will, will the building will, um, they will, the, the community will gift it to another faith community on the condition that it remains faith, a faith based building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I asked Rebecca, it's not happening fast. But I wondered if you, in your thinking about that sense of reuse and projecting forward rather than back, did you have any thoughts about, uh, what, what the, about what this building could become once it is no longer a mosque, if it will ever change again? Yeah, you know, I 
I've thought a lot about it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, in, in my core, I want it to remain a religious space, you know, and I, I don't know if I could project what the next, you know, group that comes in and creates new community in the East End will be uh, on an immigration basis. Um, but I have to say, I think I actually have quite a bit of fear that it won't be reused as religious space and will just become a landmark. Um, you know, and in following conservation in the East End, I think the big G word of gentrification is something on everyone's mind, um, you know, and are these spaces going to be maintained for actual use? Are they going to become kind of um, corpses of themselves? In thinking through the transition from synagogue to mosque that was taking place in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, there were dozens of reuses suggested for that building as a synagogue um, and not much attempt for it to be maintained as a religious space um, that especially from planning officers it was dance theater you know movie theater was even suggested residential was suggested you know all of those things came up and it was really religious community to religious community conversations that led to that becoming the next step uh, and so I do wonder, you know, kind of this intervention of heritage, well-meaning, um, and sometimes that actually precludes what could be an organic reuse. And if we create too many frameworks that deny that community basis. Um, so that's my own issue to ponder, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way to finish, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. I love the story that that Amsa shared with me that the Jewish community sold the building to the to the Bengali community as a, a kind of under market rate. I think that's a very special thing, and I also hope that something similar will be found if if it were to change. And of course, as you say, there are like you know there is no reason why it shouldn't become a mosque, continue to be a mosque, but perhaps not necessarily be a mosque to the to the Bengali community, but to other communities. So there is there is um, there's lots of op opportunities for its future. But like you, I hope it. I hope it, it remains um, a functioning, living community space rather than a rather than a kind of uh, like a you know a historical artifact. Right, artifact is a better word than corpse. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a privilege to walk through the shadows of history with my guests, with Rachel Lichtenstein, Ansa Ahmed Ullah. Hamaz Ali, Shahid Salim, Rosalind Parker, Dan Leon, and Rebecca Kaufman and to hear Jar Wobble's music. We'll play out the podcast with a little of Waver Voy's Pagamenska. Thank you to all our participants, to you, our listeners, and to Rich Mix, our partner, even in lockdown. The team behind the Dash Arts podcast is me, Josephine Burton, Christina Catalina, and Natalie Beach. You can find more episodes wherever you get your podcast, all by going to our podcast section on our website, dasharts.org.uk. And if you like the Dash Arts podcast, follow the show, share, and please leave us a review. It helps us stay visible and would mean the world to us. I'm Josephine Burton, back soon with more conversations at the Dash Arts podcast. Thank you for listening. A Jewish wedding or a Jewish uh, uh, holiday cannot go by without shedding a lot of tears. You must do a lot of crying. We cry always. When our baby is born, we cry. Why? It's, it's tears of joy.